is the dresser we're going to be making in this issue. As you can see, it has a few details on it that will help it fit in nicely with some of the other projects we made earlier this year, as well as with the armoire that we're completing up in the other project. Now, it's a fairly simple project to construct. It does take a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, but the results, as you can see, are quite stunning. So without further delay, let's start building it. Getting started on a project of this scale requires a little bit of forethought. What I do is I take the drawings, and I work from the same drawings that you do, I print them out and then punch them for mounting in a three-ring binder. And that helps me to organize everything out here in the shop. My next step is to go through and create a cut list. That cut list will have the label of each item, the quantity that I need, its thickness, length, and width. Then what I can do is plane all my material, get it all ripped to the proper width, and cut off to length before I get into all the various other milling operations. And that's where we're at at this point. So we'll begin from this stage. To get started on the mortises, what I have to do first is go through and lay out each of the locations on the components that require the mortises. Then it's just a matter of using some basic layout tools and carefully laying out the locations of where we want those mortises. Now I will mention that on the rails, we show the dimension from the shoulder point, not from the end of the tenon because truly the shoulder is your defining uh, critical measurement on a rail. So go through, get your layout done, and then we can move over to the hollow chisel mortiser and start cutting those mortises. All of our mortises on this project are a quarter inch wide. Uh, they vary in depth because of the different size pieces, and they're all a quarter inch back from the outside face. So the setup on the hollow chisel mortiser is real easy, and there's minimal adjustment from piece to piece. I've got my quarter inch mortising bit installed, I've got my depth set, now it's just a matter of drilling the holes. And the mortiser does a great job of cutting that square opening. For the legs, when switching from machining the mortises on the edge of the leg to machining them on the faces of the leg, you'll notice that the board is too thin for the hold down clamp to hold the leg down while we retract the, the mortising bit. If you place a three quarter inch piece of stock underneath the leg, everything's in perfect alignment. You don't even have to make an adjustment to machine those mortises. And that finishes up the mortising operation. For each one of the mortises that we've cut, we also have to machine a matching tenon. Now I like to machine my tenons here at the table saw. And it does require a couple of different steps, and we'll be using a couple different pieces of machinery to accomplish the complete machining of that tenon. Now the first step is to make the shoulder cuts, and we'll bring you in a little closer and show you that setup. Using my standard saw blade, I've raised it up a quarter of an inch. And the first shoulder cuts that we're going to make are across the faces of our boards. I've installed a stop block on my rib fence so that I can take each of the rails, bump them up against that stop block, and then take the cut. Now we have to use a stop block because we're taking this cut with our miter gauge. Now the miter gauge you want to, of course, make sure that it is square to your blade. And when we make that cut, hold the part firmly against the fence on the miter gauge so that it doesn't slide one way or the other. Now if we didn't use the stop block and bump directly against the fence, as we get about this point in the cut, if this part were to cock at all, either way, between the fence and the blade, it's going to cause kickback and throw the part back at us. Now our next shoulder cut is on the edges of the board, and that will establish the width of the tenon. Now most of them are at a quarter of an inch or a quarter inch high on the saw blade, but some of them have a half inch setback and perhaps even other measurements. So make sure that you get all those set at the correct height. Over here at the bandsaw, we can trim up our tenon to its proper width. 
Now I'm using a clamp-on tool guide for my fence. Of course, if you've got a fence, use that. And uh, it's just a matter of making the adjustments necessary and then taking each of those cuts. The last step in making the tenons is to make the cheek cuts. Now I'll be using our shop made tenoning jig that we showed you how to make a few issues ago. And of course you can buy a commercial unit. Now the, I'll clamp the workpiece in. I've already gone through, carefully set my rip fence distance so that I'm removing a quarter inch of material from the outside face of my part. And I've raised the saw blade up high enough so that I'm sure I'm removing all of that waste material. Now it's just a matter of cutting each of the, the tenons off and fitting them into the, the appropriate mortises. And we'll check the fit. I'd say that's a real good fit. Just a little bit snug, but not so loose that it falls out of the hole, and not too tight where you have to hammer it in. As you can see, I've gone through, fit up all of my mortise and tenon joints, and dry assembled everything at this point. And that gives me a good staging area to move on to the next step, and that's to make these little triangles. And these will be fastened on both the upper and lower sides of the center rails on each side of the cabinet. To start on the triangles, we'll be over at the table saw. To make the triangles, I'm going to start out by ripping a board to two and a sixteenth of an inch wide. Over here at the compound miter saw, I've swung it around to thirty-one and a half degrees. I've taken one cut on the end of the board, and that gave me the start of the triangle. Now what I'll do is I'll flip the board over so the other face is against our table, line up my saw blade so that I just touch that previous cut edge. Our next step is to start machining the grooves that will accept the field panels. We need to do that for both sides and the back. Now some of our grooves will be stop grooves, like on the legs where we'll stop and start inside a mortise, and then on the rails we actually go all the way through. So doing this operation, it's really better to do it here on the router table than it is on the table saw. And of course having the router table on the table saw, we've got a nice fence that's easy to adjust and very accurate. Now I've set my gap between the, the fence and the edge of the router bit at a quarter of an inch and raised it up a quarter of an inch. Now all we have to do is pass each of the boards over. The grooves for the legs, what I'll do is I'll start in the area of one of the mortises, feed all the way across, and stop at the other mortise. So what I'll do is I'll drop the piece down, feed across, and then lift the piece up. What I've done here is create a very simple jig. It's nothing more than a piece of scrap plywood and a couple more little scraps. And they're used to help hold this triangle while we machine that groove along the edge. We'll also modify it a little bit later on so that we can machine this rabbit in this area. And the jig works great for machining that groove safely. Now be forewarned that you can't just take this triangle and then flip it around and have it line up on the edges. We'll have to get all the grooves in one edge, reposition our stop blocks, and then do the other edge. Now with the router bit sticking up a quarter inch and a quarter of an inch of it exposed from the fence, we're all set to make those two rabbit cuts to create that tongue. And again, I'll be using the jig that we used before, and I just modified it slightly so that I'm sure that the the edge of the triangle is sticking out further than the plywood and that it's running parallel. Then it's just a matter of running it over in one, along one face, flip it over, and run it along the other face. And that fits up great. Now we can move on, cut the rest of them. After marking the center line position through each of the triangles and on the middle rails, we can go ahead and install our triangles. 
a little bit of glue and a couple clamps until the glue's had a chance to set up. And that should do it. Now we can move on to some of the dado and grooving operations that we need on the frame components. Now on the back center style, we need to have a 3 quarter inch wide by 1 8 inch deep groove running along its length. Using a 3 quarter inch wide stack dado head cutter, I've raised it up an eighth of an inch and set my rip fence to its position. Now we just need to take that cut. The dado that I just machined here at the table saw is 1 8 inch deep, 3 quarters of an inch wide. I cut it with my stack dado head cutter, which is up at an eighth of an inch. Over here at this end of my miter gauge, I've got a stop block affixed. And that way I can align each of the four pieces, the two front rails and the two back rails, all against the same location. And that assures me that they'll all line up during assembly. So now I'll just repeat this cut on the next three rails. This rabbit that I just machined will receive the carrier panel to support the drawers. To machine it, I've installed a 3 quarter inch router bit in my router table. I've marked the leading and trailing edges so that I can make that stopped cut. And as you noticed, I fed in and then fed the board across the router bit. And I'll have to make that stop cut on all four legs. And a little bit of hand work to remove that rounded corner. One of the last operations we need to do on the legs is to cut away that inside area to define the foot. To lay out that curve on the lower rails, I'm using what I call a bow. It's nothing more than a thin strip of wood, piece of string attached at both ends. Draw tension on the string and the curvature of the bow changes. Now you do need three control points to use this type of layout. And in this case, we've got the two corners at the ends and bottom of our rail, and then one inch up at the center point. And we connect those three dots by adjusting the curvature on that bow. Now we can go over to the bandsaw and cut away that material. I just finished laying out the little cutouts that we need on these side field panels to accommodate our little triangle pieces. Now we can go over to the bandsaw and cut away that waste material. With so many pieces on an assembly like this, I like to put everything together in sub-assemblies. So I'm starting out by assembling the two side legs with the rails and the field panels. So I've gone through and got all the surfaces sanded up that need sanding at this point. And now we'll just apply some glue in each of the mortises and clamp it up. And I'll do the same on the, both the left and the right hand side. And we'll start with the middle rail. Because of this triangle shape, we've got to get the middle rail in first, then bring the field panels in. Then we can bring in the top and bottom rails.
I'll get one more clamp across this middle rail and then we're ready to move on. Moving on to the internal components of the dresser now, I've got three birch plywood panels. Two are a half inch thick, one is three quarters of an inch thick. And what we need to do is machine a series of dados that will receive the drawer runners. Now those dados will be a quarter inch deep by three quarters of an inch wide. And they're all, on all three panels, they're all spaced evenly and the same from the top edge of the panels. On the three quarter inch thick center panel, we'll be cutting those dados on both sides and on the two half inch side panels, the dado only goes in on one face. one inch wide by three quarter inch thick strips are the drawer supports. I've already cut them off to length and sanded up the faces. Now all I need to do is sand up the edge and then we can install them. And now we can glue the runners in. No mechanical fasteners needed, just some glue and we'll clamp everything in place till it sets up. And now we can go ahead and glue in the carrier panels on the two sides. Just some glue and probably some brads because this is going to be one of those things that's going to be very difficult to clamp. We're almost ready for final assembly. Now, as you can see, I've gone through and dry assembled all of our major components at this point. Now what I'm doing is fitting up and installing, or getting ready to install, the drawer dividers. Now, of course, the, the dresser is on its side and we've got it upright this way. Now these drawer dividers go in this area. Now when I cut the dados for the drawer supports, I also cut the, the dado on the back side of these drawer dividers. So I've got that out of the way. Now to install these, we got to start out by drilling a quarter inch hole on each end of the drawer divider. And we'll use a little jig for that. I've clamped the drawer divider in my bench vise and I'm using this simple doweling jig. You can pick these up at most home centers. All I need to do is clamp it on there, aligning my hole that I want to drill through roughly over the center of our drawer divider and then drill in the appropriate depth. Now the depth is a little bit more than half the length of the dowel. And I'll do this drilling operation on both ends. Next we'll install a dowel center in our hole and we're going to use that dowel center to transfer the hole location from one piece to the other. Now to help with alignment and to make sure our drawer dividers are parallel to the bottom rail and parallel to each other, I'm using these center strips which will end up going here. I've clamped them on the two legs and they're sitting now currently on top of the lower drawer divider, which I've already installed. Now what I want to do is just bump up my rail or my drawer divider against that, as well as against the top one, and then I'll tap the top with a hammer, and that'll transfer the whole location into that leg. That transferred a little dimple onto our leg. Now I can drill that with my quarter inch drill. Now with that one out of the way, I can repeat the process on the other end up here at the top leg and then we can move on. Now these center dividers that will go along the center drawer carrier panel, those just get fastened in place with glue. I'm going to start out with the back panel area. I want to get the back upper and lower rails in place and then get the field panels in and the center style and then we can move on to the front pieces. Now I'm using a liquid hide glue because I want enough open time where I don't have to rush. I don't like rushing my, my assemblies.
Don't forget to put glue in your dowel holes. And don't forget to put glue in the dados that receive the center drawer carrier panel. And I'll just throw a clamp on here to help hold it together temporarily. And then finally the other side. And now before I add any more clamps, I'm going to check it for square by measuring across the diagonals. We should have identical measurements. If not, I'll have to throw a clamp on there and draw it into square. Now I'm just placing that vertical center divider in there loosely without adhesive at this point. What I want to do is attach this horizontal center divider to our center carrier panel, but I don't want a nail on the face, so I'm going to toenail it in right off the top edge. And then I'll do the same thing on the next one up. Now we can go ahead and install the vertical drawer dividers. And you can either tape this in place until the glue grabs a hold, or hit it with a couple of brads if you don't mind the look of that, or use one of these fancy edge clamps to hold it in place. Just take your time, make sure you've got it centered up nicely on that plywood panel. That liquid high glue has a nice long open time so that you can get everything clamped up good, but it also has a long clamp time. We'll leave this sit in the clamps for about three or four hours before moving on. With the construction of the case for the dresser just about complete, we can turn our attention to these walnut diamond shaped appliques. Now I've already laid one out and cut it to shape. Then I laid out my second one, and now we can cut it off here at the bandsaw. then a little bit of hand sanding to straighten out the edges and bevel the corners. And of course on these sharp points, dull those down a little bit too. With the sanding all complete now along the edges, we can mount it up. And it'll just simply get glued in place, but it does take a little bit of time to carefully lay out where the four corners of this diamond are going to be. I very carefully drew a center line, measured up, located my top and bottom points, and then made two little dots at each of the four points. Now our next step is to mask off the areas outside of that boundary so that we don't get any glue squeeze out on our rails. Now I should also mention that this rail is already finished sanded, so we don't have to do any more sanding in this area. Get an even coat of glue on the back, you don't have to overdo it. And then it's kind of like setting tile if you've ever done that. Place it on its spot, push on it a little bit and wiggle a little. Make sure that you're in the boundary of that tape. And then just use masking tape to hold it in place until the glue takes hold. After trimming the top to length, I then ripped it to width and sanded the edges up smooth. I also sanded a small radius here at the outside front corners. 
In my handheld router, I've got a three-quarter inch radius roundover bit. And I'm not going to cut the full radius. I'm just going to cut about, oh, we'll say about seven eighths inch of it. And I'm going to be cutting that large radius on the bottom surface. So I've got the top upside down at this point. Now I'll go through and take a series of cuts. This is a large router bit, so I don't want to take it all in one pass. Now I flip the top back over so that the top side is up, installed a quarter inch radius roundover bit, and made one pass around. Now what I'll do is I'll slightly blend together these two radii using some sandpaper hand sanding it. These biscuit slots that I'm cutting along the back rail, front rail, and into the side panels are for these little metal clips. And these will be used to fasten the top onto our frame. Now if you don't have a biscuit joiner, you'll want to make some provision for this operation, perhaps earlier on by taking a saw blade and cutting a kerf line before assembly. Moving on to the drawers now, I've already gone through and ripped all of the pieces to width and cut them off to length, and I even got started on the dovetailing. But we'll catch you up with that in a second. Now there is one of the drawer sides that you got to pay a little extra attention to, and that would be at this end, where the curve comes down off that top rail. Obviously that side of the drawer is going to be a little bit more narrow. Now what I've done, I go through and I've measured from the inside edge. And we want a 16th inch clearance between the top and bottom of our drawer guide so that the drawer doesn't bind up in there. So my drawer width or height should be 6 and a 16th. Now I also want to, when I rip this side piece, rip it at a bevel so that it kind of follows the curve set forth on this top rail. Now to get that angle I'm just taking my bevel gauge and I've lined it up as carefully as I can in this area. Then I'll tilt my saw blade to that angle, and then we can rip our final side. The angle for mine came out at a little bit under five degrees. I've already set the rip fence and tilted the blade, now we can take the cut. Now don't throw away your off cut, because that can serve as the kicker for the drawer so it doesn't tip out. So save those pieces. With the drawer side clamped in the bench vise, I'm going to be cutting my dovetails using the Keller dovetailing jig. And this jig is fairly easy to set up. Just simply sight it by eye, centering up your cuts. Clamp the jig onto your workpiece. Then using the router, handheld router with a a dovetailing bit with a guide bearing on it, all we need to do is cut away the waste material. Machining the pins on the fronts and backs is just as easy, again using the Keller dovetail system, except for this time the template has the 7 degree taper, and we use a straight router bit with a bearing guide as well. And as you can see, it fits up beautifully. Just a couple more drawers to go. As you know, the top rail on our dresser is curved, so we need to curve the tops of the drawers. Now to help with the layout, I've taken my bow and I've matched up that curve. Now I can take the bow over to the drawers, lay it on there so that when I draw my line out, I'm flush at this end and come down at this end at the height that we need. Also with the drawer assembled like this, I can figure out where I want to put my grooves 
along the inside edges to put the bottom. Now as you can see, I don't want the groove to be showing on the side, so it'll have to come through on this dovetail. Now up near the front, if we see the groove, that's okay because we'll be having an applied front later on. So I'll just measure up, and it looks like at the bottom edge of the groove, if I keep it about a half inch up from the bottom of the drawer, we'll be in good shape. Using my quarter inch stack dado head cutter, I've raised it up a quarter inch and set it a half inch away from the rip fence. Now I can pass each of the drawer's sides, fronts and backs over the cutter to create the groove for the bottom. After ripping and cross cutting the plywood bottoms, I'm now ready for some assembly of the drawers. I'm applying glue to the pins because they're a little bit easier to get access to and I'll get the front and back attached to the left side first. Just seems to make it go a little easier. And your dovetails should fit together like that. You really shouldn't need to hammer them in. The bottom just slides in, no glue. But if you do get some glue on it, don't sweat it. It is a plywood panel, so if you get a little glue in there, it won't hurt anything. After you get it all assembled, check the drawer for square by measuring across the diagonals. You should, of course, get the same measurement right on the money. Here you can see the false fronts for the drawers. I've placed quarter inch shims between them so that I can get the layout just right. And what I want to do is carefully mark the curve at the top of the two drawer fronts. Now I've used the bow that I've matched the curve to on that upper rail. I've already penciled in the line so I can go over to the bandsaw, cut away the waste material, and sand it up smooth. Now before installing the drawer fronts, there was one edge detail that I milled using the router table. I used a 3 8 inch roundover bit and took several passes around. And then I brought the router bit up just high enough so that I could score that line around to create that nice crisp edge all the way around. Now we're ready to install them. To help with alignment when installing the drawer fronts, I've clamped a cleat along the lower front rail and I've dropped it down a quarter inch because our overlay is a quarter of an inch. Now what I can do is apply the two lower drawer false fronts, then using quarter inch shims, setting those on top of the lower drawer fronts, I can install the second and then finally the top row. The procedure goes pretty easy. To hold the fronts on, I've applied some liquid hide glue. You could use yellow woodworking glue, but I prefer the liquid hide in this application because it gives me plenty of open time so that I can tweak the alignment. I don't have to hurry. I can sit there and move this around for a few minutes before finally tacking it in place with a couple of brads. Now with the adhesive applied to the front of the drawer box, we can carefully position our false front and I place some marks a quarter inch in from each edge of that center drawer divider and that will help me with my left to right alignment. And of course right now the box is centered in the opening. So I'll just bring that into position and then carefully align it with my layout marks making sure I'm resting on this lower cleat. Now with the drawer front aligned properly I can tack it in place using a couple of brads. Now if you don't have a nail gun, you could of course screw it from the inside of the drawer or clamp it until the glue takes hold. Now I'll just install the rest of the fronts in the same manner. And again using that quarter inch shim to separate the drawers, bring in the last front, line it up with my layout mark, and tack it in place. To keep our top drawer from tipping out, we need to add a couple of kickers. Now we've cut off some material from one edge of one of the drawers that has that bevel cut on it. So use that on your short drawer side. Now I do want to give the drawer clearance to, to move a little bit, so I'm using a scale here as a shim to help hold it up off of the drawer front. I've applied glue and I'll just tack it in place with a couple of brads. Using my scale, and then a piece of three-quarter inch by one inch wide stock. 
I'll place that on top of the scale, which is sitting on the top of the drawer edge, and we'll tack that one in place. Now we used this finish in a previous project a while back. And what it is, it's a 20% mixture of a tongue oil sealer and stain with a red mahogany pigment in it mixed with an 80% solution of tongue oil sealer and stain. And these are products you can buy at your woodworking store. Now I don't like to go with a real heavy bodied stain on cherry because cherry is just naturally beautiful. And putting a heavy bodied stain on it generally just obscures or hides the wood. Now to apply this tongue oil sealer and stain mixture, I use a foam applicator brush, flow it on fairly wet, let it soak in for a few minutes, and then wipe off the excess with a dry rag. One application should do it. Just brush it on, flow it on good and heavy. Try not to get too many runs. Working in one area at a time, I'll apply it to that surface, let it soak in for just a couple of minutes, and then wipe off the excess. And the key to it is to wipe it off evenly. You want to wipe it off until you've got a nice dull sheen across every surface. So it takes a little bit of rubbing, but it's very easy to apply and you get a very even stain or an even coloring using this technique. To add a little more protection to the project, I like to apply a couple of coats of a wipe-on oil and urethane product. It's very easy to apply. You simply wet the surface evenly so that you've got an even film. And then using the same wet cloth, you drag it with the grain across the finish, evening up the film. Now I'll apply two coats of this sanding lightly between coats with 600 grit sandpaper. Now tongue oil is a finish all by itself, so you really don't need to do this unless you want the extra protection. And perhaps even the, the gloss or semi-gloss in this case. To hold the top on our dresser, I'm going to be using these little metal clips. Now they work out real well, they're very easy to install, and you do have to have some slots for them to sit in along the front and back rails as well as along the side drawer panels. So all I need to really do is just place them in the slot and mark the hole location. And of course I want to make sure that I'm allowing for seasonal movement of the top. It is going to expand and contract so I don't want to push these clips all the way back into that slot. To fasten the clips against the top I'll be using number six by half inch sheet metal screws. And I do want to pre-drill the holes and be very careful at this stage. You don't want to drill through to the top surface. And now we can tighten up the clips. Don't want to over tighten them. We do want the top to be able to move. And now is a good time to apply a good coat of wax to all these internal surfaces so that the drawers slide in and out nicely. It's amazing what a little bit of wax will do to help the drawers operate so smooth. Now all you have to do is select some drawer pulls, install them, and now you can use your dresser for many years. This completes this project. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home Magazine. Thanks for watching.